Okay, yeah. Good morning, everybody. We'll be starting in just a second. What do you think? Give it to about 9.05 and then kick it off? I'd, I'd kick it off right away. There's 60 people on there now. So. Okay. When you're ready, Delendon. All right, yeah. Click over to the next slide, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Dee London, and welcome to the Trimble Business Center Power Hour. We also have Alan Sharp and Nick Fiferic with us, who will be guiding us through today's webinar. And due to such a large turnout, we will have all attendees in listen-only mode, but we welcome all questions and comments, so feel free to type them into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and we will respond accordingly. Next tab. Here's a quick overview of the agenda and everything that we will be going over today. And next slide. And with the release of version 5.20, new methods have been developed to enhance and speed up data preparation for both field and back office purposes. Last month, we looked at the new vertical design tool and showed how to use that. During today's webinar, we will be discussing the new way vectorized PDF cross sections can be used to extract data directly from the PDF. Implementation of this workflow will increase the speed of data preparation for corridor takeoff calculations dramatically. And this month's session is going over another new data prep workflow and the new method of importing cross section PDF data directly into TVC. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our team online with us today. Alan Sharp will be presenting while Nick will be answering questions in the background as they come in. So Alan, how does this work and does this in, and how does this enhance the user experience? Okay, <clears throat> well thanks very much to London um, and thanks everybody for, for coming into this session. Um, hopefully this will be useful to you if you're involved in the sort of general takeoff process for corridor work. Um, one of the things that, just to kind of give a bit of background, one of the things that triggered this change in this release was uh, working with some large customers down in uh, Texas this summer, it became pretty clear that um, digitizing cross sections was a fairly standard process, but was very time consuming and giving some examples, customers were telling me it was taking them, you know, sometimes two to three days to digitize all the cross sections for fairly major highways jobs. And they were achieving maybe finished grade and existing terrain in that process. And it was still faster than the competition, but not fast enough and everybody's trying to do the work, uh, work quicker. So I started diving into looking at how cross-section takeoff was being done. And when I started looking into it, I kind of came up with some uh, working with development, came up with some ideas of how we could maybe try to improve that and to make the model process A, more interesting, B, faster, and C, uh, give you better and more accurate results uh, in the process. Um, and to give an example, we took one job from a three-day process down to less than three hours uh, from start to finish. So people can see uh, huge production increases with the software um, over the traditional digitizing of cross-sections approach. And you end up with a far more sophisticated and better model that gives you more information than you could get out of the standardized cross-section approach. So this session is really gonna go through the main processes of that, uh, the things that have changed in TBC 5.2 that facilitate that. And um, in, this, in this hour, we'll try to get through a complete takeoff of a relatively simple railway job, but real, real world data, starting with real world plans and taking it from a PDF through to finished corridor model with uh, volumetric uh, calculations all completed. And when I did this work, I got this file from um, a dealer yesterday morning with some questions, and I considered what I was using, what I was planning to use for this session. And this this data set I thought was a better one for the presentation this morning because it's a little bit smaller, a little bit simpler, uh, and also shows uh, the processes really well. So the main uh, it, to introduce this, the main uh, the main steps here are we've significantly improved the workflows to convert uh, either PDF or CAD cross section data into 3D models. In the past, we used to convert CAD cross-section data into what we call stored cross-sections. Stored cross-sections are good, but they're limited in certain ways, whereas 3D line work is a way better starting point. And so um, in this exercise, what we did was we converted the tools that we already had into the ability to be able to process uh, the data from, uh, from, from 
imported uh, data, which is kind of 2D cross sections into 3D cross sections that can then be used as the basis for model building. And we added the ability to also do that from imported PDF files. And I'll show you that process as we go here. So in this exercise, we're gonna start off with importing PDF cross sections. Um, and as you import the data, the data is vectorized automatically. So you don't have to do any georeferencing of sheets. You don't have to georeference the sections. You don't have to trace the sections or extract the vectors one at a time. It's a fully automated process to bring the data in. And then you go through a sort of cleaning and sorting uh, of the PDF data and getting it into a structure that's ready for conversion. And in that process, you may do some minor editing to clean it up before you flip the data into 3D because it's easier to do it in the sections than it is uh, later on to do it in the 3D uh, space. And then once you've done that, you're gonna go through this pr preparation of the PDF or CAD data for the conversion. And we'll walk through the, what the steps of that look like. And then converting the PDF uh, or CAD data into 3D line work. So the processes, whether you start with PDF or CAD, are very similar. With PDF, we're gonna be working primarily in the sheet view, whereas the CAD data, you're gonna be typically working in the plan view. And it works the same way. Once you get the data cleaned and ready to flip, it works basically the same way from there for both methods. And then we're going to use some new tools to show you how to create uh, linear feature line work from the cross-section data and also then how to use the tools to create uh, the 3D surface models and then how to add those surface models into a corridor model uh, to do the takeoff quantity calculations. Okay, so um, in Trimble Business Center 5.2, the prerequisites would be that you'd need the site construction edition of the software to be able to do what I'm going to be showing you here. Um, so if you have a warranty and you have uh, TBC 5.2 and you have the site construction edition, you'll be able to do everything that I'm showing you here. Um, so the key tools uh, that we've, uh, we've improved is the import of PDF now allows us to bring in the sections into the sheet view directly and automatically vectorize the data. So that saves a lot of time. We've added a, a thing called multi-sheet view editing, which allows you to rapidly clean up data in the PDF uh, in the sheet view, and we'll show you how that works. Exploding lines allows you to convert lines that are continuous lines into component parts, and there's some reasons why that's beneficial, and you'll see that as we go through here. Uh, incrementing text, so sometimes when you bring in PDF files, the PDF data has no station or grid text, it's drawn as polylines, and therefore we have to uh, facilitate the uh, elevation and offset information and also the stationing for each section uh, in a manual method. So we added an increment text command that allows you to rapidly add station labels to cross sections. Um, creating stored cross sections from CAD drawings, uh, we've improved that so that it will create them from both CAD and also this PDF sheet view data. Um, and also we've uh, added a much better ability to draw in the 3D view. So when you're starting to model from the converted cross sections, you can work pretty much exclusively in the 3D view and start editing and drawing. And you can see the model kind of evolve in front of your eyes rather than having to digitize all the cross sections before you actually get to see the end results. Um, so it's a much more rewarding process. And then we had some additional commands called track line edge, which allows you to rapidly find uh, feature lines that run along the edges of selected uh, objects, which is why you would explode the lines. And you'll see how those two things interact as we go through this process. And then once you've gone through this, we've added some additional tools and benefits into the corridor modeling process so that you can simply add the surfaces, add the materials, add the layers, and then uh, get your quantities of the materials as a result. And you'll see this whole process through the next hour. So the key process steps, you can see on the, on the right side, we have the PDF import process. And on the left side, we have the CAD. Where you see red text, that's a unique step for that process. Where you see blue text, the process is basically the same. And uh, so in here, you can see from a CAD standpoint, you import the CAD data in DWG, DGN, uh, DXF type formats. You go through the process of eliminating unneeded data. So that means get rid of title boxes, borders, um, uh, any unnecessary text. You go through a cleanup process to get the data into a, uh, a clean and structured uh, process. So you're basically going to go through and layer data, uh, relayer information. You're going to break data up as you need it. You're going to do some joining, trimming, breaking, clipping, and maybe some drawing into the cross section to add missing information like over excavation data and stuff like that. And then you're going to run the conversion of data to 3D line work. And once you've got the 3D uh, sections uh, into the 3D world, you're then going to use tools like track line edges to find the uh, feature lines that go between the cross sections where you need them. Uh, you can draw additional 3D lines to fill in some gaps if you need to do that. 
And then from those, you're going to end up making surfaces. And then from the surfaces, you're going to make corridors. And from the corridors, you're going to do your uh, quantity calculations. On the PDF side, it's basically the same process. You're going to import the data into the sheet view, which will automatically vectorize the data. You go through the same uh, elimination, cleanup, and data prep processes. You're going to go in and potentially add missing data. Because PDF data can include text and sometimes doesn't include text, you may have to add some missing data for grid lines and elevations and offsets. And we'll show you some steps that we've added to make that easier and faster. And then maybe add some station labels if the labels are missing on your sections, because we need those to do the conversion. And then basically you're going through the same exact steps to finish up the data. So you flip the data into 3D, you track the line edges, you draw 3D lines to finish up the holes. Then you make the surface, the corridors, and do your quantity calculations at the end. So whether you start with CAD or PDF, the two processes are very similar. One's working primarily in the sheet view, one's working primarily in the plan view, but the steps and the processes are pretty much the same. So if we look at the types of cross-section that are supported in this process, um, we call them no-grid, single, and multiple. The no-grid is basically typically represented by a vertical line and a horizontal line. Horizontal line gives you an elevation datum, the vertical line gives you the zero offset, and then your cross-sections are drawn within that, and then you'll have every cross-section looks like that. Typically, those sections will have a station label, and they'll typically have one elevation label at the typically on the left-hand end. This is a fairly standard Bentley output, um, and that's what we call the no-grid approach. Now, in our software, the process of processing the no-grid, it kind of expects that the cross-section lines, the green and the red line here, would be within the boundaries of the gray lines, which are the grids. So in other words, if the section lines fall below the bottom line or they fall above the top of the vertical line then you would have to do some tricks and i'll show you those as we go through here to make it work you can either extend the grid line vertically above and below to make it cover the range of the section lines or you can use the buffer zone that's provided by the text offset for the grids and you'll see this as we get into the dialogues for the flipping process and i'll explain it there better but you can use that as a buffer to extend the, the, the reach of the, uh, the process of deciding what data goes to which section. The single grid is where each uh, section is drawn within a rectangle and each rectangle has its own grid. And those grids are labeled. And then the section lines for each section are drawn within that grid boundary. That would be called the single grid method. And in that case, most of the grids, the offsets would be labeled and the elevations would be labeled. And then we process each section individually. And then the multiple method is where you get a column grid, uh, like the one that's shown on the right side here, where the sections are drawn within the single column and each uh, grid line is labeled so you can tell the elevation range. And so we know we have to look inside a large column for a number of sections and to try to separate them out based on the elevation ranges defined by the grid lines. So those are three sort of standard methods of working. There is one other method I've come across in North America um, which is this method, which is the double multiple, where you get effectively two columns within one grid and the sections are laid out like this. Now, this is not currently directly supported. So to handle this kind of grid, what you would have to do is use the clip command to break uh, all of the horizontal grid lines at these yellow dots. Um, that would give you something you could then delete out. So then you would delete out all of the elements down the center line here to make a gap between the two and you end up with two column grids and you can process that as the multiple method. So there's a, a slight data prep exercise for each sheet to eliminate that central portion so that we can actually see it as two discrete uh, columns of data um, and we can process those without any problem. Um, when you're building the cross sections, this is kind of a fairly typical thing. This is what you're gonna see in the example we're gonna go through this morning. We're provided the data in this form where the green line represents, for example, existing terrain. The gray line represents the embankment fill. And on top of the gray line, you've got a blue line, which represents, in this case, as a ballast railway um, uh, underlay. And then at the bottom, you may have an over-excavation area. And it's typically going to be drawn something like this in the, in, the, in the sections that you're provided. Now, when we're building the models, while you can build surfaces from those elements without any problem, in terms of doing a corridor model and building of the quantities into this, we need to restructure the data slightly to make it usable. So bear this in mind when you're playing with cross-section data is that you've still got to get the data into the form the business center expects for the doing the volume calculations. And that, by this I mean that the finished grade 
needs to look like this in this particular case. So it needs to go edge to edge and cover all of the subgrades. So you can see I've incorporated a line at the right hand end where it is above the uh, over excavation area. The finished grade would need to extend out at least to where it ties to the red line as it comes up to the existing terrain. And that way the over X is completely 100% below the finished grade model. Same on the left hand side, you'd need to have the finished grade going all the way out to cover the, um, the, uh, the gray line, which would be the uh, subgrade one or subgrade two or whatever information that you may have there. And then your second surface can be as simple as an orange line that goes between these two points. And above that, you would say is subgrade material one or whatever they call you, whatever material that is. And then when you do your over X, you would add, you could also do this second line as that shape. So you could have it completely going across and it can overlap and be on top of the finished grade model. Uh, it doesn't have to have an offset as long as it's uh, exactly the same, it should work without any problem. And then your third surface would be your over X surface like this. And at that point, that over X will be a cut from existing terrain and a backfill um, uh, material, uh, which would then be the same material as is under the embankment itself. So you would fill basically all the way up to the embankment with the same, uh, the same material in this case. If you wanted to backfill the over X area with something different, then you could add a, another subgrade surface in to do that across here to cover that requirement. So remember these things, the finished grade must cover all of the subgrades. So in other words, you need to make sure your shapes are drawn very similar to what I had here. Subgrade can be a simple short line with the material above it, or it could be the complete line going from uh, edge to edge on the orange line here. And the over X would be underneath here and go end to end and make sure it's 100% below the finished grade. And remember in Business Center, when we're applying, um, when we're applying uh, fills, you apply the fills above the material layer. So you say above the orange line is subgrade one and above the red line is fill, for example. And you need to make sure you define those materials in the site improvement manager. So let's dive into the software and take a look at the process here and see how this all comes about. So one of the things I'd say when you start off here is I'll, I'll post this on the forum today for you. This is a, an example template that I use for doing CAD cross-section conversion. You'll see in my uh, layer list, I have um, uh, set up for road alignments and road labels. So here you can put your alignment and alignment labels. Here you've got a, a layer where you can put your uh, linear features once you've uh, imported the data. Here you've got CAD cross section for demolition. So typically you find off of demolition areas, so uh, pavement removals, uh, demo, dem, uh, limp milling surfaces, for example. And then you have always got your existing surfaces. So under existing, you'd have a layer for your existing uh, materials and you might have existing subgrade under that as well. Now, under here, you'd have finished grade and I typically do this and I'll show you why I have these two layers in here when we get to that point in the process. Um, the grids, uh, you always need to have the grid labels, the grid lines and the station labels. So I have layers preset for those so that I can put my data onto these automatically. And then beyond that, there's often miscellaneous information or over X information that you might need to add to the model. You might have structures like barriers, bridge decks, capping stones, all these kind of things might be in the cross section. So it's beneficial to have a template with all your line work preset or your, all your layers preset, colors preset. So as you process the data, it's ending up in a structure that you understand, and then it makes your life a lot easier as a result. So get a good structured template before you start and then uh, the whole process will work more smoothly. So the first thing is to start a new project using your template. And once you've done that, then the next step is to import some data. And in this case, I'm pointing my importer at the folder where I've got a PDF file. And this PDF file, when I import it, because we import it and vectorize it automatically, we never actually show you the image. So the DPI setting or the dots per inch setting is not really relevant for this particular process when you're working with cross sections. In here, you enter the page range. So I know that this cross-section data set is in here. It's a whole set of plans and it's on pages 12 to 14. So I just put in page 12 to 14. And here I can say import a sheet. This is the new thing. So here we can say bring in these PDF pages as sheets, as opposed to bring them in as, uh, draw, as images that we then would georeference into the plan view. So we're gonna bring them in as sheets. And in here we give them the name. So I'm just giving it a name, rail job pages 12 to 14. 
And the last setting here is, do you want to join dashed lines? And you can say yes or no to that. And I recommend that you always set that to yes. That means if you get grids that are set up as dashed lines. So sometimes you'll see lines very much like the grids in Business Center here on the screen. And if they're dash dot dot, then you have lots of lines you've got to join together before you can get the grid. So when we import the data, we join the dashed lines uh, automatically. Uh, same things for existing terrain. Often those are drawn as dashed lines. And so you get a continuous line for your existing and it makes your life a lot easier uh, to process the information quickly. So we're gonna hit import here. And when we import the data, it takes a few seconds. And uh, what it's doing is it's importing the three uh, pages, vectorizing those and creating a plan set of this name over here. And that's gonna show up in your project explorer. And so in here, you'll see that you've got a plan set called rail job and underneath that it's got a PDF uh, and underneath that PDF, there are three pages. And so you can open up an individual page uh, directly and uh, just by right clicking there. And this is kind of how the data looks on a single sheet. And then you can look at the individual sheets just by changing which sheet you're looking at here and you can see the data as you need it. So the, the key bits of information on these sections, so this based on the information I gave you earlier on, this is a single uh, cross-section type because each cross-section has its own grid. In this case, they also have some additional information with these drop lines uh, with boxes underneath. You have the station labels that you need, you have the offset labels at the top of each cross-section, you have the elevation labels down the side, and then you have your existing terrain and your design surfaces within this. But there's a lot of information on here that you don't need, like title boxes and borders and that kind of stuff. So one of the things that I looked at when I first started doing this kind of work was, okay, I can go into each individual sheet and I can spend time kind of selecting data like this and deleting it one at a time. But if I've got a hundred sheets to do that, that's a lot of type, that's a lot of work one sheet at a time. So what I said to the developers, it'd be really nice if we could show all of the sheets that are imported in one block in one go. And so what we did was we added the ability to, if you click on the, the sheet set level and, and hold the shift key down while you right click and do a new sheet view, or if you click on this up here and hold the shift key down when you pick at the PDF level right here, what will happen is it will load all of the sheets into one view. So now I'm showing all three sheets on top of each other. And it's not it's, it's once you start showing one layer at a time, you can actually do quite a lot of sorting out of information with all of the grids on the screen. Now, obviously the more pages you add here, the harder that becomes because there's more and more information. So we recommend that you don't bring in more than 10 to 20 sheets in one sheet set. So if you've got a hundred sheets across sections, I would bring those in as five blocks and then process each block as a group, as opposed to trying to process a hundred sheets in one go. Obviously the more sheets you have, the more time consuming it gets. Um, if you're showing all the data on screen. But when you're looking at all the sheets in one view, then I can just highlight all of the data for all sheets right now and delete it very quickly. I can easily go through this, for example, here, delete this data, do the same thing over here, delete that data, zoom in on this little piece here and get rid of that. So some stuff like that is really quick and easy to do when you've got a lot of sheets on the screen. Not saying it's useful for every process here, but it's certainly useful for many of the processes that we go through. The next thing that you need to look at is, okay, so let's take a look at the uh, grid text, for instance, because you'll see, if I click on this text here, you'll see there's some CAD multi-line text. There's three pieces of it here. There's also some CAD polylines at this location. Because in this particular example, the text is drawn as text, but they've also drawn it as polylines. So when I look at this data here, the text is gonna be useful and I can use that. The polyline text is less useful. And the nice thing about this is we split the text off from one into one layer group and we split the polyline versions of that into a different layer set. So now we can just highlight on here, pick one of these pieces of text and now we can use the isolate button in the view filter manager. So just hit isolate. So one of the things we added in, in this uh, release was the ability to click on one object and then click on the isolate button. And now we see just that layer of information. Now, when we look at the grid text, one of the things that you'll see in here is there's words in amongst it. Down here, there's additional offset and elevation information. In some cases, there may be additional numerical values on the screen. And one of the things I do just religiously is to try to eliminate the text that I'm not gonna need in a drawing. Um, not because it may always cause you a problem and maybe it's an unnecessary step, but if you don't do it, sometimes you leave a piece of numerical value text on the screen and it can get confused for an offset label. So I 
I religiously go through these things and get rid of the text that I know I don't need. And if it's a lot of sheets, uh, I'm doing uh, all the sheets at once here. Um, but you can do one sheet at a time if you need to, or you can use things like advanced select. So if I was going to go into edit and query, advanced select, I can say pick all the text on this screen. And if I had 20 sheets of data, I might say just find the text uh, items and let's see if this property and put in the word text here and then say the equals and I can say let's say elevation and it highlights it down here and then apply and that highlights the elevation text just delete that select everything again and then let's say I want to do the same thing again and this time I want to use the word offset and apply and that then picks up any offset text did I type that correctly uh, CAD multi text just do that one more time text that has a name yeah text that equals and put in and then pick this value right here and apply and you can see it highlights that for you and you can go through that trying to find the text that incorporates the elements that you're trying to do so that's one thing that you can do and I use advanced select a lot when I'm doing this type of work to find lines of certain lengths and that kind of thing You'll see that in just a minute. So I'm going to go through here and clean out some of the other text very quickly just to kind of get this down to what I need. Just to show you that there's a process here. And that just takes a couple of seconds. Okay, so the other thing that I look at typically as well is ambiguity. So by ambiguity, I'm saying, okay, we've got some offset numbers right here at the top of each grid. And we've also got these elevation layers on here. We've got elevations on the left-hand right side. These kind of can get quite close to each other in some cross sections. So what I typically do is eliminate all of the text on the, on the right-hand side, because we only need the grid labels on one side. And that gets rid of some potential ambiguity in, in interpretation of the data. Um, and that's the important thing. Nice thing about cross sections is they often have all of the cross sections in exactly the same place on each sheet, just the numerical values might be different. And so you, by doing this, you're cleaning out all of the data on all sheets, which is kind of nice. The other thing that I would say about ambiguity is that you can also get like a number value here that's very close to this number on the offset axis. And I typically will get rid of the, uh, the topmost grid label in each cross section. We don't need them all anyway. We only need two to calculate scale. And so I would go into all these, actually highlight that one again, uh, just get rid of all these top layer elevations just to be safe. What I hate is doing something and then having to do it again. So I typically do a process every time I run these things just to make sure that I get the data always set up the same way. And then I know it works, right? Sometimes you can leave stuff in and it will work just fine. But I, I go through a religious process, make sure I get it always set up the same way and then I'm in, in good shape. So now I've got all that data as I need it. I'm just going to take that data and put it onto my CAD uh, grid layer or grid text layer. So I have that already set up. So grid labels. And that's my offset and elevation labels done. So now I can unisolate that layer and see all my data again. And now I'm just going to click on the grids layer, for example, just click on one of those and isolate that. And that's all my grids. Now in here, you can see that you've got these little tick lines. And these may or may not be a problem. Um, if they're not a problem, you know, you can again risk it and leave them behind and hope that it doesn't have a problem with it. But again, what I would do at this point is I'd pick all this data and I would do advanced select. And I would say pick all data of type polyline and this property and has a horizontal length less than or equal to. And I'm going to use a number value here. Um, I, if we don't know what distance it is, then you can just use the measure tool and go in here and just measure from here to here. And it's telling me it's 0.025 inches. Now, when you're working in sheet view, you're working in inches, whereas if we look in the plan view, you're working in feet. The software is still thinking in feet. So what I would do now is in this field here, I would type in 0.025 in, and it will convert it into uh, the feet value and then hit apply. Oh, sorry. 2.025. Okay, and at that point, it's highlighted all of that data, and I can just delete it. And now I've got my grids as I need them. So I'm now going to take that data and put it under my grids layer. And you go through this process of uh, getting these three things set up as you need them first off. 
Next layer is your station labels. So go in here, find a piece of text that's one of your station labels, isolate that layer. And now again, you can see all these labels. There's no other text on here. All these labels look good to me. And the format of this, we're just looking for a numerical value with or without plus or slash, depending on where you are in the world, slash would be Europe, plus would be North America. Um, and that's based on a project setting. So if you go to project settings, uh, just be aware that you need to make sure that you have this setting uh, as you need it. So it's under, I think under units, under, uh, where is it, uh, station? here somewhere uh, uh, where's the value here it's in here somewhere there's a, a setting for what value uh, you use for your station labeling uh, angular azimuth I can't find it off the top of my head but it's in here somewhere um, so it's maybe on the coordinate units Anyway, it's in here somewhere. I can find it later on and post that on the thing. But anyway, you change that setting to a slash from a plus when you're doing your station uh, numbering process. And once you've got that set up right, then it will read the plus or the slash and it looks for that in a text string. So this other text is just ignored. It will find the station labels for you. So again, in this data, once we've got it as we need it, we can say, take all that data and let's put it on our CAD station labels. So again, having a layer set up for that helps a lot. And now we can unisolate. So now we're down to, we've got rid of some of the data and got it onto the layers we want. I would typically at this point now turn off that group of layers because I've got my grids and labels set up as I want them. Um, and now I'm going to go in here and start trying to find which layers I also want to find. Now, all of the layers we imported are in this section, the uncategorized layer groups here. And so what you can do now is you can say, well, that's my original ground. Let's uh, turn off that layer to start off with. This is my design surface, let's turn that one off. And then all the other data on this layer is pretty much stuff we don't need, right? So now I can just invert here, and now I've got the layers that I want to work with. Um, and so the key now is there's some stuff on these layers that is stuff I want, and there's these grids that are left behind the outer boxes of these grids that I don't need. So I'm just gonna go through each of these and just go through the process of getting rid of them because we don't need those, just delete that. And that's now nice and clean. And so within this now, you now want to find your original ground surface, isolate that, and then move it onto the layer that you want for your original ground. So in this case, I'm going to pick that line and let's see what we get when I isolate that. So all those are my original ground layers. So I can just grab all of those. Now, very often when you bring in PDFs, you might find that these are in pieces, um, they're not con nice continuous lines. So you may want to run project cleanup on this, often you'll find that these are in pieces and there's overlaps and duplicates and sometimes you get two or maybe three copies of the same data, depending on the PDF. This one happens to be relatively clean. You can see just by clicking on a number of objects, you only get one. But you do want to check that because obviously if you've got three of everything, it's going to make it harder later on to model it and you might find some uh, problems with it. And this again, bear in mind, I'm still looking at one multi-sheet view here, so I'm looking at all my sheets right now. But in this case, all the data looks pretty good. I can grab all of that and say, let's put it onto my CAD cross-section existing. So I'm just gonna put it onto my existing layer. And that's that one done, unisolate. And so now if I turn off my existing data, so just turn off that now, now I'm down to my designs. And in here, you can see what I was talking about earlier on is you've got multiple lines that represent the design surface, but our finished grade needs to run all the way over the top of all these. So how do we solve this? Now, there's a couple of things that I would say when you start editing cross sections in the sheet view, because the sheets are very much smaller than the real world, whereas in, in CAD, in plan view, you're working in real world coordinates. So the width of the cross section is the full width of the cross section in the real world. When they've generated the cross sections onto sheets, you're bringing it in and you've got, you know, uh, many feet is represented by maybe an inch or half an inch or whatever. And so, the scale is very small. We have a point tolerance in business center of 0.1 of a millimeter. So when we start editing stuff, things that are closer than 0.1 of a millimeter together on a line can get uh, thrown away or disregarded. And that can have a negative effect on cross sections in some situations. So one of the things I recommend is that before you start editing things, it's worth actually using uh, the scale command to bring everything up to scale. So I'm just gonna go back to here and say view all, turn everything on, 
pick all the data here, and I'm going to run the scale command um, in here. Now I know that by reading out the offsets in here, half an inch is uh, 20 feet in the horizontal, and half an inch is 10 feet in the vertical. So to scale this up, I need to scale the horizontal to 480, and I need to scale the vertical to 240 to make it one to one. But I can leave it at 480 and leave the exaggeration in. That's fine, but it's just getting rid of this very small point tolerance, making everything big enough so it doesn't get disregarded. So in this case, I'm gonna scale everything from zero comma zero, and I'm gonna say lock the axes and scale it to 480 and say apply. And it's gonna lock the horizontal and vertical so it'll still be exaggerated in the vertical. Now zoom extents again. And the data looks exactly the same, but it's now just much bigger. And that means we won't lose any of the fidelity of the data going forward. Now, I just wanna check this to make sure I got it right. So when I measure a distance between here and here, it should, be, it should be 240 inches. 20 feet is 240 inches in the sheet view. And I measure it in the vertical, it would be uh, 10 feet because it's uh, uh, exaggerated. Okay, so now let's go back to this again. Let's turn off the existing, turn off the finished grade, uh, sorry, turn off the um, CAD uh, grids. And uh, now we can turn off all of the other layers and just look at the finished grade. Uh, actually, I need all those layers turned on a minute layer that stuff yet so let's just highlight that layer and isolate it okay so this data is the basis of my finished grade so I'm going to grab all that and put it onto my finished grade layer and remember I said I need the tops so at this point I can turn off the isolation I can turn off all these layers because I'm done with those now go to my finished grade open this up find that data now we have some tools in Business Center that allows us to find the top of a surface or the bottom of a surface. So the top would mean it would track uh, along the ditch, up over the top here, down, and it would stop at this point. Coming along the bottom would, for instance, come along here, come around the bottom and do that. And you can do that to find the bottom of subgrade and the top of finish grade very quickly. So in here, we can go into here and we can use this track cross section command, pick all the objects, say you want to track the top, and what layer do you want to put it on? I'm going to put it on this CAD XS finish grade top, which is going to be my continuous end-to-end -end cross section for the finish grade. And then you can put in a, a gap closure tolerance and a join tolerance just in case there are small gaps in the line work. And if there is, then it will close them out with these tolerances. Hit apply. And at that point now, if I turn off these layers and just turn on the grade top, what we've just done there is created all the tops uh, following the finish grade surfaces we need it. And that's the surface I need to better build my models uh, for the finished grade. And then I'll hang my subgrades, which are part of this subgrade over here. Uh, I can now go into here and say, well, I now need to work out which is my subgrade one and subgrade two. So these are my subgrade ones. So I'm gonna go through that, for example, and relayer that data for each cross section. And this might take a few seconds to do uh, because it's all on one layer. Sometimes these are much nicer organized. Sometimes the layers have layer names. And so you can work with those, sometimes not. So depending on the data, this can be a sort of a semi-manual process or a fully automated process. But anyway, you're gonna go through this and you're gonna get all the data layered up as you need it, uh, as subgrade one, for instance. Again, this is a nice simple job because there's only you know, 1,500 uh, feet of, of cross sections and maybe this one as well. So there's three, two there, two there, two there, three, 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 two there and there's three there and three there okay so I've got all the subgrade ones so in this case now I'm going to go in here and change the layer of those to my CAD cross section subgrade one and then I've done that I'm going to turn that off and now I'm going to go in to get my subgrade two so these are my subgrade twos and again just a few minutes work to get this as I need it And if you've got nice uh, data that's sticking out along one side, you can use a sort of window select to do this, which makes it a little bit quicker still. And you'll learn different uh, selection techniques as you go through here to make it faster to find things that you need. Okay, so that's now my subgrade two data. And then you might have this third surface. Now this one, I don't need it because this is all part of my finish grade as well, and it's the topmost surface, so I don't actually need that data at all. So I can now turn that off, leave that back on, and if I turn my subgrades back on here, here, 
Okay, now you can see I've got my data set up with three layers, three colors, and everything is in good shape. Now, when we get into the cross section and the editing of that, the next thing is you're gonna to want to do is explode this up into component lines. And the reason I say that is later on, we can track the feature lines that run along the edges of these lines. And it helps if these lines are not continuous that they're actually broken into segments. So what I do finally in here is to say, let's grab all that data and let's run a macro called explode lines. And that explode lines macro here allows me to select all those and I can use a deflection angle. And I typically use something like 10 degrees. And what that will do is if you've got multiple elements along one line and the line doesn't have any deflections in it, it will leave it as one line. But when it gets to an angular corner like this, it will actually break it here and here. So I'll get one line down here, one up here, et cetera. And obviously the bigger the angle you make it, uh, the more uh, or the less you're gonna get. So if I put in here, for instance, most of these are gonna be at maybe 20 degrees. So let's say 20 degrees. And we can say, okay, that should give us what we want. And a deflection angle is the angle that goes from here to here. So there's this angle in between here that would be the counting value here. And if you have closed polygons, which you get often in Bentley cross sections for finished grade, you might have an asphalt layer, which is a rectangle and a pavement subgrade layer, which is a rectangle. When you explode them, you can also break them into different layers. So you can have the tops, which would be this line, the bottoms that would be this line and the verticals, which would be the side lines of the rectangles would be on three different layers, which again, later on, when you start working with the data in 3D, makes it easy to uh, connect the lines and make them into surfaces. Um, so again, doing this work at this stage really helps. So I can hit apply at this point. And what that's doing now is it's breaking these data down. So I now have these data lines as I want them into individual pieces. So I can actually track the elements uh, later on uh, to make surfaces out of them. Okay, so now I've got my existing terrain done, I've got my finished grade done, and I've got my subgrades done, and I've got my grids and my label text done. Once I've done that, the next step of all this process is to then take all this data and convert it into 3D. So to do that, I need an alignment, and to do that, I need to know what the maximum station label is. I just happen to know it's 1770, and it starts at station zero. So minimum you need is an alignment. So you go to corridors, create an alignment, and you're gonna give it a name, so I'm gonna call it rail how, and we're gonna put it on a lower layer, and again, I use road alignments, so I'm just picking R for road alignments, and in here, I'm just gonna say, let's create it, and if you've got one, you can import it, or you can type in the alignment off the plans, but as a takeoff, the minimum you require is a straight line, so starting at station zero, let's say starts at a coordinate of a thousand, an easting of a thousand, and let's say I've got a line, going due east and its length is 1800 feet. And that's all I need. I don't need a vertical, but if I have a knowledge of the vertical, um, you know, the elevation values, you can see the elevation of the center line is about 1110. It does help sometimes if the vertical alignment puts the alignment up close to where your data is at least. So I would normally go in here and say, okay, starting at station zero, 1110 and ending at 1800 at 1110, so at least I've got a horizontal alignment and a vertical that's kind of close to where my station, uh, my sections are. And having got an alignment, then I can close that. And if I go to my plan view, you can see the alignment right here, okay? So now I've got all my CAD cross-section data prepared. I've got my alignment prepared. Um, in this case, when we do stored cross-sections, stored cross-sections are completely referenced to the alignment. So if you change the alignment, the cross-sections go with it. In this process, I'm gonna convert it into 3D line work. You don't want, you don't get the chance later on to change the alignment in that case. So uh, one thing is if you are gonna want it on the curvilinear line, then you definitely wanna make sure you get your alignment in at this point and use that alignment because you don't get a chance to chase, chase it later. But if all you're doing is in a quick volumes, then a straight line for the road is, is good enough. The only downside of that is if you've got big embankments and you've got tight radiuses, you don't actually get to see how the sections interact with each other like you would do in a real world where you get the 3D alignment. So be, be aware, having the true alignment is actually beneficial unless the line is fairly straight anyway. Okay, so now we wanna flip this cross-section data into 3D. So the way we do that, I'm gonna to go to my corridor cross-sections menu and I'm gonna run the create from CAD command. And even though it's PDF data, it's still CAD data um, at this point. And so we're gonna pick, we said we need to pick the single method of uh, conversion. So this is single grid cross-section, so here's where you'd have the no grid or the multiple that I talked about earlier on. You pick the alignment that you just created, and then this setting here, the maximum grid distance from the grid. Now, in this type of grid, 
this distance is the distance from the end of the grid label to the insertion point of the text. So what I normally do here is just turn on the insertion point snap and then use a quick measure command from this grid end to this insertion point and see what this value says it is. It says it's in here, it's 117 uh, inches. Um, so in this case, you need to be aware that that's gonna be the value I need to put in here. So you could type in here 120 IN and it converts it into feet, which is happens to be 10 feet in this case. Um, Station text, is it above or below the cross sections? In this case, the cross section text is always below. So in this case, we're gonna say below here. Under here, the data you're gonna transfer, we can either pick 3D lines, which will convert this to 3D line work, or we can pick stored cross sections. I typically now wouldn't recommend the stored cross section approach. I'm typically all doing, always doing this now with 3D line work, because it's way more flexible and in many ways more enjoyable than working with the cross sections. But if you wanna use cross sections, you can still do that. And then when you get down to this section where you're picking the data, what you're gonna do is you're gonna pick all of the data. And that's all of the sheets I'm picking right now. So it's I'm still in the multi-sheet view. I never went out of that at all in this process. You pick the station text layer. So you can just pick on a piece of the text to, to pick it. The grid lines, just pick on a grid line to pick it. And your grid text, just pick on a grid text item to pick it. And then your data source, if you're working with PDF data, here you pick the PDF uh, source, uh, the sheet set. If you're working in a plan view for CAD data, you pick the, the plan view. But here I'm just gonna pick the PDF sheet set and then you just hit apply. And at that point, now it's processing all the cross sections and now in the plan view, you can see all those cross sections have been placed. And if I open this up in the 3D view, those cross sections are now all three dimensional cross sections. Uh, and again, this is a process I ran starting from the cross sections from the sheets from soup to nuts and it took about 45 minutes taking off the first 15 minutes for the, the slide deck um, to do the whole process for 100 and, you know, 1500 feet of cross sections in this case. And it really doesn't take much longer when you have more cross sections if the data is relatively clean. Now I'm just gonna show you a couple of steps and I'm gonna fast forward to a kind of an end game model just to show you the last couple of tricks that we go through once we get the data like this. So now we've got our cross section data here that we wanna work with. Um, now you're gonna start building the models as you need to. So let's just isolate this layer, the finished grade top layer and isolate it. And so I talked earlier on about linear features. I can just, you can see occasionally you might get the odd line string like that, which is of zero length. So you can just delete it. If you see a spot on the drawing like that, you can just make a surface model. So if you just grab these and you say, make a surface out of it, so go to take off surfaces, create surface, and let's say this is finished grade. And you can say it's a design surface and let's give it a color red for design. And we pick those and we say, okay. Now that builds me the surface model. So if I, if I unisolate the data here, let's just turn off everything first. And let's just turn on the finished grade top and turn on that one surface. So. In here, I didn't have my uh, settings set right, so I'm just gonna change that to 150, and that should fill in those gaps. Now in here, you can see that without doing any work at all to form the linear features, the software is doing a pretty good job of building me a finished grade model, because I've got everything in a straight line here. I may have some triangle edges to clean up in these areas. Um, I may have the odd area where the triangulation isn't exactly as I need it. And in that case, then you'd start looking at it and say, okay, I now need to add some linear features to that. So if I turn off the surface a second and say, okay, let's take a look at how do I build linear features. So we added some tools in the macros. So if you don't have the macros, go to um, uh, rockpilesolutions.com and download this TML status command and then install all the macros that you can get. There's a lot of free ones. All the ones from here back to here are free commands that you can get from that website that this links you to. And there's a session next month on macros and we'll talk about how to use this in more detail next month. But in this command here, I'm gonna use this track line edge command, which is we used the explode lines earlier on, the track line edge one we're gonna use right here. And in here you can say, I'm gonna use a reference alignment, the rail how, and what it does, it uses that to determine the sequence of the cross sections, that's what that's for. And it determines where the left and right edges of something are. And because I broke these down into single elements, I can now go in here and say, I wanna create edge lines, and we allow to do edges and boundaries. So if, for example, 
you want a boundary around the area that I'm now going to select, you can say create a boundary as well and put it on a different layer. And sometimes you'll get row jobs where you get, you know, a section of sections here, then another section up here, and there's a gap between them, like either side of a bridge. Well, the boundaries around the areas allow you then to make a, a, a surface out of all of the cross sections and then put the boundaries that you created as surface boundaries to limit the areas to just this piece and this piece and have a gap in between, for example. So creating both the edges and the boundaries is often a good thing. You don't have to do it all the time, but it helps in many instances. And then so in here, you can put in a suffix if you want to, but then you can just start picking the lines that you want to track. So in this case, I'm going to pick out just the tops here to start off with. And I'm just going to go through this quickly uh, just to kind of show you kind of how to pick these. And I don't have time, obviously, in this hour to do everything. But let's say that's one we want to track. We hit apply. And that now created me those edge lines through here. Then you do the same thing for the edge details along the edges here. So maybe not that one, but let's say between these right here. For my embankment strings. And let's say that's where I want to limit it to and hit apply. That creates me my embankment line. Same thing over this side. And again, if these were, you know, separate layers for walls or for bridge decks, it makes it much easier to pick. Now, sometimes you'll see in this case, there's a group of lines right here. So I'm having to pick a group here rather than just one individual and hit apply. And that creates you the embankment. So you can very rapidly go through here now using this new tool to build out your, um, your, your features as you need them. Just make sure you pick everything in this case. And then you can say track edge. And so you go through this process and then where you can't create them automatically, you might need to do some manual editing. So we improved the 3D editing. There's a macro called quick line, which is a line string command, but with uh, works much quicker and doesn't have all of the overhead of the line string. And then you can just sort of draw in between the sections as you see fit and it snaps way nicer now than it used to. So we can actually now draw the model up in 3D and build our linear features. So very quickly, I can create the 3D line work that I need. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to jump fast forward. You do that for each of the surfaces, the finished grade, the subgrades, get your models as you want it, then make a surface model out of that. And then the last step is you're going to add those surfaces to a corridor model. So I'm just going to open up an end game model here. I always hate doing this to people, but you can see I've done pretty much all of the process, all of the steps for that job in less than an hour. And when I did it, as I say yesterday, in, in less than two hours total, I did the whole, uh, the whole job here for the customer. Um, so in this case, now we've got all of our cross sections. We can close that. If I go to the 3D view now. Let's take a look at the existing. And there's all my existing cross sections. And if I look at my existing surface to go with that, there's the existing surface that was created from it. Now you may get the odd flag because you may get the odd little vertical node or two nodes on top of each other in some of these cross sections. That's not untypical. And you just need to go in and use the line string editor to fix that. Um, then you have your finished grade model. And again, in this case, there were some vertical faces that I haven't had time to go in and fix in this particular example, but you would do that. But now you can see by putting those linear features in, I get not nice sharp lines. And in this case, when you build the model, you then don't need to use the cross-section data that you have. You only need to use the linear features to build out those models. You do the same thing for your subgrades. So there's your subgrade surface one and your subgrade surface two. So each surface is now created, modeled. You'd fix up the, uh, the few flags that you have. And then having done that, the last step of all this is to then convert this into a corridor model. So here's the corridor that we created. So you go into create a corridor. And let's just go into the corridor to show you what we set up here. Let's go edit that. And in here, we just say create a corridor, give it a name. Um, uh, we're going to uh, give it, use the horizontal alignment, the vertical alignment of the job. We're going to use the existing grade surface as our existing terrain. And we're going to reference it down here as the existing model. And that's all you need to do for the creation of the corridor. Then you create a template. And in the template, you give it a name. Like in this case, I gave it T1. And let's just edit that template a second. 
And in that template, what we do is we create surface instructions for the finish grade. So we just say, add a surface, it's the finish grade surface, and we're gonna make it a material layer called finish grade. And then we do the same thing for the subgrade, and we're gonna call it subgrade one. So it's a surface subgrade one. And in this case, we say it's got a material in this case called subgrade one. And these materials are set up in your uh, site improvements manager. So we go to MSI manager, go to materials. In this case, I made them earth and select. So I had subgrade one, which I colored in this kind of brownie orange color and the subgrade two that I colored in the orange color. And that's all you need to do in here. Just create these. You can put your shrink and swell factors in here if you need to. Um, and having done that, you do the same thing for subgrade two. So we've got three surfaces. So now as I scroll through the model here, now what I'm getting is I'm getting my existing terrain is the green line. The top line is my finished grade. The orange is my subgrade two and the brown is my subgrade one. And as you go through the job here, you can see the materials for all those and they're all showing up over here. And having done that, the last step of all this is to run your, once you're happy with this and it's all working. Now in here, sometimes you may need to, if you didn't do a good job of cleaning up the data in the sheet view, then you may get areas where these don't tie quite right, in which case you may need to add a tie to bring it up. So I would spend more time working on the sheet view data to clean it up and the CAD view data to clean it up before I flip them. So I have all these things locked in. You can see over here, this cross section comes down below the existing terrain, but it doesn't tie back up. So we're tying up automatically uh, to close it out, to give us a volume. And so if you get areas which don't fill out with volumes, it's typically because you've got a leak or you've got a gap or you've got something that wasn't fully underneath the finished grade model. So I spend more time making the cross sections look right, trimming and extending and clipping and joining and all those kind of things to make the sections good before I start trying to convert them. Because when I get downstream to here, the editing, I want it to be as fast and as quick as possible to get what I want. And within here now I can run area calculations within those boundaries. I can run length calculations from the feature lines that I've created. I can run all my cross section quantity volumes for my materials. And I can do that all very much quicker than I could have done using digitized cross sections. And the process is more rewarding and more fulfilling. I think as a user, I find this is way more enjoyable because I'm building the model as I go and I can see things appearing as I'm doing it. Whereas digitizing cross sections, you're there for a long period of time, digitizing all the cross sections, and you don't know you've got a problem until you get to the very end. And at the end, then you've got to go back and start cleaning those up. Whereas in this, you can see the problems appearing uh, as they happen, and you can fix them as they happen. And it's a much faster, much more rewarding process. And as I say, I've done jobs that customers have told me you've taken them days, and I've done them in hours. And so you can strip out many, many hours in this process once you get good with the tools. So that summarizes the uh, the process here. I just want to jump back to the presentation here, just to kind of cover one more slide, which is the recommendations here. So just to kind of wrap up here, when you're processing this data, the first thing is get your data onto separate layers. So grids on one layer, grid labels on another layer, station labels on another layer, and then each surface, get it onto different, uh, different surface layers. So it's easy to work with once you get it into the 3D view. Do that elimination of the top and uh, bottom most elevation label so it can't get confused as an offset value because sometimes you leave them in place, it can think the horizontal uh, for the uh, original ground goes out much further and you'll get some strange results. Sometimes you'll get problems with cross sections because of the data, you just have to, you have to look for the problem. If you do get stuck with that, email it to me or to one of, the, one of the team and we'll take a look at it and try to advise you what's wrong. Um, if you're gonna edit the sections, I recommend that you scale them up to full horizontal size rather than trying to work with them at this reduced sheet size because then you'll get none of that um, zero length stuff elimination, which is the problem when you do scale it up. Um, check that there are no duplicate lines. Duplicate lines can hurt you later on, so really spend time making sure your data is clean before you flip it and do the work in the, in the plan view or the, the sheet view before you flip the data because it's way quicker to sort it out there and some of the tools work better there because it's working in like a plan view as opposed to a vertical uh, section once you get it into the 3D view. Use layer groups to group the data into prepared groups just like mine, have a good template to start off with, that really helps. And make uh, edits to the data um, that will help you once you get into 3D. So do that exploding of the lines, make sure your lines all close out nicely, trim and extend those to close out the gaps. You can see in this example, it was nice data, so it didn't really have many problems, but in some cross-section data, it's more horrific than others. So you have to do more work in some cases than others. 
And then you can also draw in additional information to those cross sections before you flip them, or you can flip the data, then draw them in and then flip some more data if you want to. You can flip as often as you want, um, but you can draw in over X areas, for instance, into those cross sections if it's not in the plans, using your design rules for that, for the footings of walls and things like that. And then you can flip those and then you can use those to form over X models for doing the over X quantity. So you can do a ton of work with this and you can really be very flexible in what you do to end up with some, some uh, truly great results. And the customers that I've been working with on this over the last three to four months as we've been developing it, they're all saying the same thing. It's so much faster to do it this way. Yes, you need to know Business Center. Yes, you need to know how to use the CAD tools. Um, uh, but it's really only a few tools you have to learn and we can train those very quickly. And yes, you do know, have to know something about the corridor modeling and how to build corridors correctly. But if you can get the basics down on this pretty quickly, running two or three jobs, you'll become quite expert at it and you'll take hours or days out of your uh, takeoff process. So on that basis, I'm gonna hand back to Nick and let Nick kind of cover uh, resources and next steps. Um, unless there's any questions at this point, Nick, that we need to look at. So Nick. Sorry, there we go. Got me. All right. Um, so questions that we have currently, um, looks like the, really the best, the best question that came up, and I'm assuming that they're just going to have to do it kind of in a manual process. Um, but maybe you can, maybe you can put some, uh, ideas to this. Um, if you have a system where all of the lines are layered under the same layer when they extract the data set and are colored the same way, do you have any tips that would make this any, any faster? Yeah, so the, the biggest challenge I found when I'm doing this, and I, I do have an action to try to get a, a command to help in this process, is when you get, for instance, multiple subgrades on a single layer, you're trying to split them out onto multiple layers. Um, you, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to do with the data downstream. If you really need all of them, then yeah, you need to split them out and that does take time. Um, we can probably automate that with some additional commands to make it a little faster. But what I do is I try to find something that is uh, relatively unique about the data. So length of line can be used in some cases because some of the subgrade lines are shorter than finish grade, for instance. So the first thing is to maybe strip away the finish grade. Um, you can do things like, you know, um, sort by, uh, by the, uh, the line weight. Hopefully when you bring it in, they, they do get separated to a point, but that is the biggest challenge is if you've got four lines for each section on the same layer, because they didn't layer it in the CAD system that created it, then we do need to spend the time splitting it away. And that's the most time, time consuming piece right now. Um, and I think we can make an automated tool to make that faster. And as I say, I've got that as a high priority uh, on the list of things to do in the next couple of months. So I'm hoping that we'll get a better answer to that in, in due course. Um, but we can also do things like separating out vertical lines from, from uh, horizontal lines. So vertical lines like the edges of uh, subgrades, you don't really need those in the process at all. So we could get those and filter them out and put them onto a, a different layer. But that's the sort of stuff you can eliminate quickly using the advanced select tool. So if you, if you know your subgrade vertical lines are less than a foot long, for instance, and everything else is 10 feet or greater, then you can say search for all lines less than 1.1 feet and it will find all of those. You can then stick them on a layer to get them out of the way. That helps the, with the selection process for the other stuff. And as you eliminate some things, if you turn off those layers, as you put them onto different layers, you, your, your data is reducing all the time. So it makes it easier, uh, but it's not, that's the, that's the worst case. That's the, the worst thing you have to do right now is that piece of the work is separating out data onto different layers, but it's still a lot quicker than digitizing. Okay, so I'm going to take the screen from you so I can control the PowerPoint here, Alan. So you guys should okay. be seeing my screen at this point. Um, just kind of taking over. Uh, thank you very much, Alan. I appreciate it. Um, you taking the time to come out here or rather get online in this case and uh, do this presentation for us. A um, couple more resources that you guys should know about that are online and available to you at all times. Um, first off, uh, based off of just the base, basic uh, page that you go to download the actual software, uh, we have these webinars posted right there on the latest webinar, as well as customer success stories, uh, bulletins, white paper, and stuff like that, that uh, for information of the software itself in written form. Uh, we have the uh, YouTube uh, channels that are available for you guys online. Uh, both, uh, this is accessible in your uh, support 
tab within the software itself too. And in fact, a lot, some of these resources are, so do explore that um, support tab because there are some training resources there for you. Um, we have, uh, Trimble was hosting these two power hours. This is the uh, construction side of it, but we do have a geospatial uh, version of this as well too that goes over maybe not necessarily what, you know, what pertains to construction, like they have like a mobile mapping um, presentations and stuff like that, but they do have stuff that goes over point clouds, drone editing, drone data collection and stuff that can help you out. Uh, we have our TBC community pages. If you guys want to converse with users across, across the nation, this is a good way to go about doing that, getting onto these forums um, and uh, talking out workflows uh, amongst your guys' peers. Our TBC macros community page, uh, we'll be expanding on this uh, next week, but this is where you guys can uh, request macros. You can uh, download macros and get these type of objects from them um, as well as workflows. Our Trimble Retrieve site is a library of videos that we have posted online, again, accessible through the support tab that you guys can uh, sign up for and uh, receive trainings and, and information through that, both on their iPhone and on a computer interface. And if you guys have, uh, you know, any, for those who you know, haven't used Business Center at this point, if you would like to, we have 30-day uh, codes. Um, just contact your local um, the SciTech and, uh, or Trimble distri uh, distributor, and they will get you all hooked up with that. Next week, we will be, or rather not next week, but next month on the 14th of January, we'll be uh, hosting another presentation uh, that's going to be covering the macro interface um, going over what they are, how do you get them, uh, and any questions uh, thereof. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, just post them on uh, the, the uh, question tab here, and um, we'll get them answered for you. Perfect. Thanks, Nick. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming on. I've tried to answer a few of the questions that were on the forum while Nick was just talking. And uh, if anybody has any further questions or follow up, please feel free to email me, alan underscore sharp at trimble.com. That's A L A N underscore S H A R P at trimble.com. Or you can contact your SciTech or your regional rep and they can connect you through to us. Um, but please feel free to reach out while you're working with this. I saw one question on here from Jeremy, uh, uh, Jeremy Poulter. Jeremy, if you've got an example where you had a problem with station equations, could you send it to me? I'll take a look at it. Um, I'm not sure what your issue was there, but I'll, uh, if you can send me an email, um, I'll take a look at that question uh, for you one-on-one uh, -on -one, and I'll maybe post something on the same forum uh, where we put the link today for this video. And I'll also post that template that I'm using for my conversion process because I think you can see how useful it is to have a good template to work with and you can download that and install it and I'll put installation instructions up there today for you as well. But again, please feel free to reach out. Please ask questions through the forum um, and work with us on this stuff. Uh, you will find it significantly better than doing it the long hand way and uh, hopefully we'll hear some good stories from you going forwards as to the successes that you're having with it. So again, thanks for everybody to attend and we'll wrap up here, I guess, Nick. So. Yep. Thank you very much. And uh, further, further uh, webinars will be posted on the forum page as well. So if you ever have a question of when these are and, um, or how to register to them, we'll provide that right on the forum. Okay, perfect. Thanks Thank very much, all. guys. Yep, yep. I'll see you. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Thanks to London.